passer à la première séance de, de cette matinée, euh, présidée par Pascal Massard, à qui je passe la parole. Bonjour à tous. Alors aujourd'hui, j'ai une tâche euh, à la fois facile et, et agréable à accomplir. Elle est facile à, à accomplir parce que euh, l'orateur de la conférence euh, Le Cam est quelqu'un qui parle parfaitement le français. En tout cas, il le comprend parfaitement. Et pour la bonne et simple raison que, peut-être tout un chacun ne le sait pas, mais Peter Bickel, qui est évidemment une figure de proue de la statistique américaine, euh, est né en Europe. Peter Bickel est né en Roumanie, à une époque euh, troublée, euh, qui l'a contraint à voyager pas mal avec sa famille. Et il a fait une étape en France à l'âge de 8 ans. Et c'est là qu'il a appris le français. Et il ne l'a pas oublié. Donc ça va beaucoup me faciliter la tâche. Euh, je vais donc effectuer cette petite présentation en français. C'est aussi une tâche très agréable parce que euh, c'est une occasion pour moi de témoigner toute mon estime et toute mon admiration à Peter. Donc Peter Bickel a soutenu son PhD en 1963 sous la direction d'Eric Lehmann. Ça fait donc 50 ans. Et en 50 années d'une carrière particulièrement féconde, Peter Bickel a balayé un nombre de sujets impressionnants, contribuant de manière profonde à l'élaboration de théories devenues des classiques. Robustesse, théorie de la décision, statistique de rang, statistiques semi-paramétriques, bootstrap, sont des exemples de domaines que Peter Bickel a marqué de son empreinte. Depuis une quinzaine d'années, il s'est également investi dans les nouveaux sujets liés à l'explosion dimensionnelle des données, initiant à la fois des travaux théoriques dans le domaine de la statistique en grande dimension et des travaux pluridisciplinaires en interaction avec la biologie ou encore la finance. Peter possède une personnalité scientifique ouverte et généreuse. Il a formé de nombreux étudiants dont certains sont eux-mêmes devenus des leaders de notre discipline, Jeff Wu, John Kingfan, Don Andrews, Yakov Ritov, sont quelques-uns des noms les plus connus parmi les gens que Peter a eu l'occasion de former. Il a également assumé des responsabilités administratives très lourdes dans son université à Berkeley et également au niveau international puisqu'il a présidé l'IMS et il a également présidé la société Bernoulli. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous demande d'accueillir chaleureusement Peter Bickel. En honneur de Lucien Lecam, qui était mon collègue pendant plusieurs années, était un des plus grands des statisticiens de, de la génération avant la mienne. Euh, bien que j'ai fait ma thèse avec euh, Eric Lehman, que euh, j'honore beaucoup aussi, euh, je pense que euh, les idées de Lucien ont eu peut-être la plus profonde euh, influence sur euh, ma pensée aussi. Euh, et encore, je, je suis euh, merci d'être invité, pas seulement pour ça, mais aussi parce que euh, j'ai l'occasion de faire la, la connaissance de jeunes et pas si jeunes. <rire> statisticien français <rire> que je n'ai pas connu. Enfin, je ne sais pas si tu as dit, Pascal, que je vais euh, 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 parler en français, mais pas pour la lecture. <rire> je l'ai fait il y a, mon Dieu, 33 ans à, à, à Saint-Flour, euh, mais... Euh, 33 ans sont passés <rire> et l'anglais, c'est ma langue presque maternelle. <rire> a dit, en les dernières années, je me suis intéressé beaucoup aux choses grands, haut dimensionnelles. Et in the last few years, uh, very much in uh, inference for networks, for graphs. Um, so, Let me begin, of course, <laughs> with a picture of Lucia, for those of you who didn't 
who didn't know it. And uh, this is a, a very typical uh, welcoming uh, position. Okay. So here's an outline. I'm going to talk about networks, some examples and references, and then some statistical questions. Uh, a non-parametric model for infinite networks. This is, can be introduced in various ways. Uh, some asymptotic theory for the average degree of the network tending to infinity faster than log n. That turns out to be a, a regime that we can understand rather well. It's the regime where, for example, for those of you who know erdos uh theory, uh, there are no isolated points. Um, then I'll talk a bit about maximum likelihood and variational likelihood, and this is work which is related, oops, sorry, uh, to, uh, related to work of some uh, statisticians in France, uh, Dodin, Aubin, uh, Célis, Chanaron. <laughs> uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about spectral and other clustering, which I think is the, perhaps the most um, promising method of fitting models in this context. Some application to examples and then some discussion. Uh, although I have, I am working in biological applications, uh, none of the examples are really serious because the serious applications are very messy, as <laughs> most of you know. So first, identifying networks and working with given ones. Uh, there are really two aspects which often go together in, uh, in application to networks. Given vectors of measurements, Xi for example, given gene expression sequence, nearby binding site information, determine dependency and causal relations between genes, the genes being, being the vertices of the network. The other is given a network of relations, edges, identify higher level structures, clusters, for example, pathways in genomics. In practice, both can be and are done, um, can be done simultaneously, but I will really focus on the models for two, that is, we're given, we're given the graph. Here are some examples of graphs. As, as, as you may know, uh, the, the, uh, this area is at the confluence of quite a few disciplines. Uh, it, it's been of great interest in the social sciences for applications for many years. It work on theoretical work in probability theory started with a fundamental paper of Erdős and Reni in the early 50s. Uh, there has been interest among physicists, uh, really related to statistical mechanics, but now uh, having broadened considerably. Um, and of course, there's been the tremendous um, impact given by the creation of networks nowadays, like Facebook, uh, the internet, and, and so on. So here's an example of a Facebook network for Caltech. Uh, with 769 nodes and average degree 43. So you'll see, from the theoretical point of view at least, the average degree is, plays a big role. Um, the, uh, this is of course not very informative, and in fact, all the pictures that I'll show you are very pretty, <laughs> but not terribly informative. <laughs> um, and part of what I'm interested in is trying to, 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 to uh, sort it out in a in a more statistical way. So here's a transcription network for E. coli bacterium with 423 nodes and unfortunately much more common average degree which is 2.45. So we're getting larger and larger networks nowadays but the average degree is not large uh, typically. Here is something that physicists like to work on a lot, collaboration networks. Again, it looks beautiful. Uh, you have an edge if two people collaborate. The vertices are the, are the uh, authors of the papers. Uh, 
But from this, not too much, not too much could be gotten. And again, you have the phenomenon, large number of nodes, low degree. Here are some selected references to networks. And I think I put these down just to show you that there's a great deal of activity in the area and that it comes from many directions. So uh, this is sort of on the borders of physics and computer science, which I should have mentioned earlier also, um, by uh, Mark Newman, a physicist. Eric Kolachik has a paper in, on statistical analysis. Easley and Kleinberg uh, uh, have networks on a book. These are all books on, on, on networks, or the large books. Then there are papers in probability and mathematics generally uh, on the behavior actually of the kind of models that I'm going to be talking about. Some work by uh, authors here um, on, on some aspects of uh, unlabeled graph models uh, and, um, and others. I, I, I don't expect you to absorb all these names uh, at once. Uh, the papers that uh, I've uh, been involved in are a paper which is now three or four years old in the PNAS um, with Ayu Chen and another paper in the Annals with Lisa Levina and Ayu Chen, which I will, uh, both of which I will mention a bit. And then a very recent paper which has just been accepted by the Annals with Dave Choi, which relates to some of the work of Dodin, Picard, and Robin. Uh, the question that I will focus on are, is community identification for block models. But just to make, put you on notice, there are many other questions like link prediction, predicting edges between nodes based on partially observed graphs. Model selection, which I will talk about a little, oops, sorry. Uh, come, oh dear. Ah, <laughs> pressed the wrong button, I'm afraid. Um, model selection, which is actually something I will talk about at the very end, which is a fairly critical question, is how do you select the number of blocks in, in block models, as you'll see them described. Testing the stochastic identity of graphs using count statistics. These are sort of fundamental quantities. Uh, error bars and descriptive statistics. Models incorporating edge identification errors. And of course, directed graphs and graphs with additional edge and vertex information. So, let me start with the models that I'll be focusing on. Um, so, the uh, first, sort of the, the most primitive model, which was introduced by Erdős and Rennie, is the uh, model in which you basically are given a set of nodes. So, these are, I'm not going to start talking about probabilistic models for graphs. And these are unlabeled graphs. So, an unlabeled graph can be identified with a symmetric matrix of zeros and ones. So I and J are connected by an edge if the entry in the matrix is one, and otherwise they are not connected. So a probability distribution on graphs can be thought of as a um, probability distribution on such matrices. So the erdos renyi model is um, simply that you basically put on the edges independently with a Bernoulli P distribution. There's slight variance of this, but that doesn't matter too much. Then, that's not of great interest from a statistical point of view because it's so uniform, right? You, you can't really have, expect any unusual structures <laughs> in any part of the graph. However, uh, uh, Holland, a statistician, Leinhardt, and I always forget the name of the last author, uh, have generalized this model to a uh, very simply to something which in fact uh, does make statistical sense and is at least easy to think about. So you have k communities and what happens is you uh, probabilistically you assign the vertices to the communities according to a multinomial distribution with probabilities pi 1 through pi k and then having done that you then have probabilities of forming an edge which depend upon what community the two vertices have been assigned to. So you have this. 
So Erdos Reni is, of course, the case where all probabilities are equal. Is that okay so far? Am I going too slowly? <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So now let me talk about a non-parametric asymptotic model for unlabeled graphs. I always feel more comfortable talking asymptotics. This model can be actually was introduced by, by Lovash indirectly, in, in a, not in this way. Um, it actually was appeared in this way in work of Aldous and Hoover. And from a statistical point of view, it's a very attractive presentation, I think, because it ties it to the theory that one knows. So suppose that you have a probability distribution on unlabeled graphs. Now imagine that you can embed this n by n graph into an infinite graph. So now you have probability distribution on doubly infinite graphs. Now if this is to be an unlabeled graph, it's natural to require that this probability distribution be invariant under permutations of the vertices. Right? The vertices, you have no information about the identity of the vertices, and so the probability distribution should be independent under permutations. And what are such probability distributions? Well, it turns out they can be characterized, and I, this is, as I said, this was done by Aldous and Hoover, by um, AIJ being one or zero if you have an edge, a function being a function of a suitable supply of uniform variables, although these can be something else as well. Uh, so alpha, xi, xij, eta ij are uniforms. You have this function g, and then the function has to be symmetric between in the middle two, and the um, uh, eta ij actually are not iid, they're I, eta ij equals eta ji, and aii equals zero. What does this all mean? Well, what it means is that you actually can think of any such distribution as a mixture of ergodic probability distributions. That's what the alpha does for you, it mixes. And then the ergodic probability distributions are aij equals g of xi, xij, and eta ij. And now you can see that basically what this is saying is that what you have, whether you have an edge or not, is dependent upon something which depends on the two vertices, a to ij, and then something, two things which are common, one to one vertex and the other to the other vertex. And that induces dependence. And of course, this is determined, but unfortunately not uniquely, <laughs> by the conditional probability that aij equals one given xi equals u, xij equals v, and h of u equals h of vu. And for those of you who know Definetti's theorem, you can see that this is essentially can be thought of as a generalization of a Definetti's theorem. That is, if you think of sequences of random variables on the line and you ask that the joint distributions be invariant under permutations of the indices, Definetti tells you that this is a mixture of IID distributions. <laughs> well, these distributions are, for networks, the analogs of IID distributions. This model, of course, was proposed, but not in this clear form by, in the social science literature, for example, by Hoff, Raftery, and Hancock. Uh, essentially, the same thing was analyzed by, uh, but uh, in a rather abstract form, Bolobash, Riordan, and Jan Janssen. And in some ways, it's equivalent to something introduced by Lovash, as I mentioned, called graphons. Um, OK. Now, there are some unfortunately rather essential differences between this stru these structures and IID. H is not uniquely defined. That's fairly clear because if I make a measure preserving transformation of the Xs, of the uniform random variables, that doesn't change the joint distribution of what I see, but it of course changes the underlying variables. Now, there is a canonical version and which is determined by taking, forming this function, which looks mysterious. Tau of z is this integral. 
But that's nothing else than the conditional probability that AIJ equals one, given that one of the vertices takes on the value Z. And it turns out there's essentially a unique version of this, which is monotone increasing. In fact, all it is, it's the, uh, can be thought of as the quantile distribution of the distribution of degrees. And that turns out to be independent of the, of the, of the, of the representation. Okay, where are we going with this? Uh, I should mention at this point one uh, word of caution, which is this business of H being not uniquely identified looks innocent. After all, we can have random variables which are not, uh, you know, where you have distribution function, only the distribution function is the unique object which, which characterizes them. But, as I mentioned in passing earlier, you don't have to start with one-dimensional uniform variables. You can start with multivariate normals. In fact, that's what Hoff, Raftery, etc., started with. Now, that means that I give you multivariate normals. You give me a function of pairs of the multivariate normals. The Xe's are now multivariate normal. And I get the same probability distribution. Now, the function that you get on uniforms, if you start out with something which is very smooth in the multivariate case, but you bring it back to the uniform, is not a nice function. Because measure preserving transformations from RK to R are not very nice. And so that indicates that the problem of identifying things really depends in some rather strong way on the representation or can depend in a strong way on the representation. Now, as I said, I'm going to do asymptotics. And there's another issue which arises at this point, which is, of course, what you want to do is to let the h sub n's go to 0. Or sorry, the h sub n's um, be fixed and n go to infinity. Now, if you leave the h sub n's fixed, there's a problem. Because if that's the case, then you can easily see that the expected degree is of order n. But as you've seen from the examples, the expected degree is typically of much smaller order than n. And therefore, you really want to study an asymptotic theory where you let the probability of an edge go to 0. Oops, damn it, I'm sorry. <laughs> ah, where am I? Yes. <laughs> um, so actually, what I like to define things by is this function W of uv, which I believe uh, in, in this other context, Lovash calls a graphon, um, which is basically the conditional probability joint density of the uniforms given that there's an edge. And so you decouple, essentially, the structure, which is this conditional probability, from the average degree, which is determined by the probability of an edge. And now the average degree can range from big O1, which is the favorite domain of the probabilists, which is very hard and actually uh, problematic for statisticians, to big ON, which is the one where we just determined, um, uh, you know, that's where, where H is fixed. Okay. Here are some examples of models now put into this form. Uh, the block model, which I mentioned, is actually pretty simple. It's a model where H takes on a finite number of values on the uh, unit square. And uh, they're given uh, as follows. There's something called the degree corrected block model because, as you'll see for, for reasons which are not immediately obvious now, the block model the pure block model has the tendency of having its inhomogeneities purely a function of the degree. In other words, large degree vertices are, blo are blocked in one way, low degree vertices are blocked in another way. That's not usually what one is interested in, as you'll see. So these physicists, Carr and Newman, proposed adding more uh, latent variables, theta i, theta j, individual probabilities of forming a degree. Of course, that raises the number of parameters to order n, 
which may cause some problems. Um, but, but if you, for example, assume that these latent variables only take on a finite number of values, what you're getting is a parametric submodel of a KJ block model. Then, just to show you that uh, ideas come from all sorts of places, a very early and nice idea is due to DeSola Price. Um, I'll describe it in a second, but before I do that, one of the things that people have noticed about block models, which makes them not so satisfactory, is that the degree distribution doesn't look like the degree distributions that one typically sees. The degree distribution that one often sees, or at least infers, because you can never prove it, is a power law, right? Where the, where the, where the frequency of vertices goes down like a power. Well, uh, of course, if you go now to this formulation, where you have this W, which is unbounded, you can have power laws. So in the limit, so to speak, you can have power laws. But how do you get power laws? Well, here is this very attractive formulation of DeSola Price, which unfortunately is implicit <laughs> here. It seems hidden, but I can describe it to you very easily. It's described, it's a probability model which is, which is obtained dynamically, as follows. I have a given set of variables, of, of vertices, and then along comes a new vertex. And the new vertex now links to one of the old vertices with probability proportional to the degree of the vertex. And if you pass the limit here, as n goes to infinity, indeed, the initial situation goes away. And what you are left is a uh, w function which is defined implicitly in this way. But you can solve it, and you can easily show that the degree distribution, which turns out to be this function tau of u, or the inverse degree distribution, is um, a power law. And of course, you can modify this. And that, of course, as you can see from the name, uh, reflects the idea of preferential attachment. You know, those who have are more likely to get. <laughs> so if you have a lot of friends, you're more likely to make friends, is the, <laughs> is the uh, sentiment of this, of the DeSola Price model. OK, so I have, however, I'm not going to treat the DeSola Price model. I'm actually not even going to treat this question, too. I will just talk about block models and the issue of how to classify a vertex by its community, right? I mean, that's the problem. Suppose that you have a block model. I give you the graph. Can you actually identify the communities and who belongs to which community? No, did I jump? Yes, OK, fine. All right, well, this question was, was considered algorithmically by physicists for quite a while. And in particular, Mark Newman and, and, and uh, a collaborator, Michelle Gervin, proposed a, a criterion for, for identifying communities, which is not probabilistic, but is intuitive. Basically, what constitutes a community? A community basically should have more internal relations, more internal edges than external edges. So, um, so you form a statistic, which roughly speaking, for any set of assignments of communities, this E is an assignment to K communities, measures how community-like these communities are. And then, of course, what you do is you maximize this, this quantity as a function of these splits into K communities. Now, uh, there's another function, which I'll just mention briefly, which is also of that type, which is you can say, well, let me assume that I know what the communities are, what the assignment is. Then, statistically, let me ask, what are my estimates of the parameters of the block model? Then, I take these estimates, which are easy, because now everything is well known, it's a multinomial thing. You can plug it back in. And when you've plugged it back in, you get this thing called the profile likelihood, which also depends on the assignment. Well, it turns out that if you have a consistent, pro if the population of version of F is consistent, 
which means it, uh, the optimizer, sort of the population optimizer of the criterion agrees with, with the true parameters. And this quantity, this uh, property holds, lambda n over log n tends to infinity. Then, remarkably, you can actually identify every member of the community with probability tending to one. <coughs> you nail them all perfectly. Now you might say, how can you do that? Well, you think with n observations, how can I possibly do that? But I don't have n observations, right? The observations are the edges. And they're of the order of n log n observations. And therefore you can do that. Now the profile likelihood actually enables you to do that always. The newman girvin likelihood sometimes enables you to, to do the identification because it's not always consistent. And then there's an easy corollary that, in fact, the statistical problem, in some sense, goes away <laughs> once you're able to do this. <laughs> because once you've, once you've classified everybody perfectly, there's no problem in estimating parameters, <laughs> right? I simply count. <laughs> so, so uh, and these are, of course, efficient because they're exactly what you get if, as if you knew what the assignment was, which is an easier problem. And here's a famous example which is always trotted out. Uh, it's not a big network, but it's a so-called karate club. And the karate club uh, is split, in this case, with, by newman girvin and uh, profile likelihood into, um, into two communities. Um, and as you can see, profile likelihood doesn't give you the same split as newman girvin does. Now, it turns out that newman girvin is right in some sense. Why is it right? Because it's been known for this community, for this pair of communities, that there was a fight in the karate club. <laughs> and half the people decided not to speak to the other half. <laughs> On the other hand, what is profile likelihood doing? Well, it's doing something perfectly legitimate too. It's simply dividing according to degree. And, if you go and decide that there are going to be four communities, all of a sudden everything is fine. Profile likelihood also basically, if you take two sets of two communities, you get the right answer. Whatever the right answer is, of course. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, degree is also a perfectly plausible answer, but not a very instructive one. Okay, now let me talk briefly about maximum likelihood for block models, and this is related to, to, to uh, in fact, was inspired to some extent by results of, of Robin, uh, I think, Doudin and Celis, which is, what, what can you say about the properties of maximum likelihood in this case? Now, maximum likelihood is not a pleasant quantity. Why is it not a pleasant quantity? Well, look at it. That's the conditional likelihood given the assignment. But now, to get the actual likelihood, you have to marginalize out, marginalize out the assignment. So this is a sum over n choose k terms. Um, but uh, you do have one nice formulation, which is the graph likelihood ratio, which is the conditional, the, basically the like, uh, likelihood ratio for what's observed is the conditional expectation of the whole likelihood ratio given, given the data. This is a formula that I think most of you know, and it's one you should keep in mind if you don't. Um, well, uh, this was partly proved by, by this, what I'm writing down, more, more something like it, was partly proved by, by uh, Robin and uh, Dodin and, and Celis, I believe. But what's true is that if, in fact, again, in this nice regime of lambda sub n over log n tending to infinity, there's a mild regularity condition, then Essentially, the likelihood function for the unknown, for the data that you see, is equal to this likelihood function for data that you don't see. <laughs> and all that's saying really, in essence, is, and in fact it can be deduced to some extent from the result on, on, uh, on modularities, basically, you in, with, with high probability, Given the data, you know the community assignment. <laughs>
Well, if you know the community assignment, you can write down the likelihood. <laughs> and this actually, this thing really has bite primarily in the region where you're contiguous to the value theta. So it's Lucien's, uh, <laughs> an analysis using Lucien Lacombe's theory which, which, which works well here. And consequences of the theorem are that you have, again, efficiency, consistency, what happens. But there's a bit of a problem, and uh, it's suggested by these other mysterious s statements about pi hat var and, uh, what is it? Yes. Which is that, of course, the likelihood optimization is also an NP-hard problem. Right? Because you have to go over all possible choices. In fact, it's NP-hard at every stage if you use, if you use EM. Uh, on the other hand, there is another method, which I won't go into, called variational likelihood, which comes from physics, which in fact can solve this, the original problem in, I believe, n cubed or something like that. Not very good, but still. It's, you can do it. And as you see, this says that variational likelihood will work like likelihood itself. Okay. Now I want to get to what I think is the most promising approach to fitting block models. And block models you really can think of in some sense. If there are any approximations to a general model, the block models are like histograms. <laughs> and so they're quite natural. So let me begin with something quite abstract, if you want, which is an inequality due to a man named Oliveira, which has been generalized by Joel Tropp and a sort of other problems. It's a very beautiful uh, um, inequality, which has to do with sums of IID Hermitian matrices. And what you do is you look at the deviation of the norm, the operator norm, of the sum of the matrices, right? From its mean, you take the mean to be zero. And what you get is a bound which looks very much like the bound if these were scalars. This is a hoofding type bound. There is, however, one significant difference. It does depend on the dimension of the matrix. OK, using that, you can come to a much simpler method. First of all, notice that this implies the following. Let's suppose that we now go back to the general formulation and we look at, so W is again, if, let me remind you, the conditional density of an edge given uh, C1 and C2 being the members uh, corresponding to the vertices. Okay, take, we can't do this, of course, except uh, theoretically, we can take this function W, which we don't know, and re label the matrix using permutations so that the Xs, the arguments, are in order. And then it turns out, it's not a difficult exercise of Oliveira's inequality, that if you look at the matrix and divide it by the average degree, lambda n, and subtract off what is essentially the conditional expectation matrix. I'm sorry, the adjacency matrix has to be permuted in the same way as this one does. And you look at the conditional expectation of the adjacency matrix given that, which is just this function, that difference is big O P root log n over lambda n. So lambda n you can think of, let's say in the case where the degrees of order n is just root n. So, so it's, it's, sorry, it, lambda n is n. <laughs> so then this is root log n over n. So this should look fairly familiar. Now, Let's look at what this W matrix looks like for block models, okay? Well, for block models, right, this W function takes on only a finite number of values. And therefore, if you look at the matrix, the W matrix, what you see is, although it's an N by N matrix, it consists of K squared types of rows Repeated. <laughs> Therefore, it is indeed a finite dimensional, a bounded dimensional matrix, whatever be n. 
And that plus the previous results suggest that by Oliveira, if the k eigenvalues of W are distinct, then the top k eigenvectors of A correspond to the top k eigenvectors of W. And so k means clustering on the pros of projections of A on at least k eigenvectors gives perfect classification with high probability under the same conditions as newman girvin clustering or whatever. But, of course, doing a spectral decomposition is a much simpler thing than doing newman girvin clustering. It turns out, but for reasons which are fairly subtle, that the symmetric Laplacian can also be used. This is what's called the symmetric Laplacian for graphs. D is the matrix of um, degrees, diagonal matrix of degrees. Then that actually works just as well. In fact, it works better. And in a sense, you can say that the, um, an observation that was made by Shainaron, Dodin, and Robin about clustering using the degree distribution, which is very simple, doing k-means on uh, k clusters on, on a one-dimensional distribution, uh, then, in fact, that's even easier, you might say. <laughs> that also works, provided, unfortunately, that the degree distribution gives you the communities. And that's not by no means necessarily true, right? In fact, often the degree distribution is very degenerate. And you cannot block it out in any decent way. So, so uh, and in, in, in practice, at least it's been my experience of this method, does not work very well. Uh, and that's partly, again, because it's trying to do things. I mean, it, it can do things <laughs> like the profile likelihood, if you want. But um, it doesn't perform well because it can't pick out these sort of subtle patterns which do not depend on the degree. Here's the Karate Club, uh, just to show you that it's done, spectral clustering performs perfectly. I'm going to skip over this quickly, but take my word that it does. <laughs> then there's another example, which is perhaps more striking, that you have blogs, political blogs, at least it's of interest in the United States. You have political blogs, and edges are formed between blogs if, I guess, one blog refers to the other blog. And of course, there are Democrat blogs and Republican blogs, and this separates them quite well. Um, I have, I guess, two minutes. Am I right? Or more? How many minutes do I have? Do you know? <laughs> oh, 10. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> Okay, but five minutes, really, since you, I want to have some questions, if possible. Okay. Uh, wait. All right, so comment spectral methods based on A give communities, based on degree size. Laplacian methods work better. And combining with a likelihood of sorts, which is a pseudo-likelihood, seems best in practice. That, of course, I haven't established for you at all. <laughs> Again, best in terms of of uh, the story. Now, there's a, a conjectured result that I'll get to, which is actually tries to answer what I think is a very hard question because people ask it all the time, and that is how, how do you decide on how many communities you have? Now, if we're statisticians, what we'd like to have is, for example, what we might try to do is we look at the likelihood ratio, let's say for a k plus one block model versus a k block model, and if that's large, we go to k plus one blocks. And if not, we stay with k blocks. Well, for reasons which are not immediately apparent, that turns out to be actually quite difficult. And um, what we have been able to do is to show, is to give you a criterion for when you should, when you have two blocks or one block, right? I give you, I give you a, a graph and you decide Shall I split this into two communities or just say it's nothing's happening? It's Erdos Reni. 
And the idea uses the fact that, the, um, that if k equals 1, the matrix W is of rank 1. So there's only one non-zero eigenvalue. If k equals 2, there are two non-zero eigenvalues. So the idea is that you want to test the hypothesis that the second eigenvalue is 0. The only trouble is to get at the second eigenvalue for the matrix A is not so easy. However, for the Laplacian, <laughs> it is easy because for the Laplacian, the first eigenvalue is 1, and the first eigenvector is known. And so you can take out, you can take out the first eigenvalue, so to speak, out of the Laplacian. And then you want to test the hypothesis that the maximal eigenvalue of this matrix is 0. And what we have is a conjecture, which I think we basically proved, but there's still some odds and ends which may, which may fall apart, which is sort of amusing and ties this whole story in with another big body of theory, <laughs> which, which is very uh, much in the air, uh, called uh, random matrix theory. Right? For, 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 uh, for example, uh, Ian Johnston developed tests in the multivariate normal situation for various things, right, when the dimension and p go to infinity. And what happens is that turns out that things depend on a very curious distribution called the tracy widom distribution. That's what TW1 is. And the conjecture is that the second eigenvalue is a constant divided by root n plus another constant divided by n plus Tracy Widom. And unfortunately, you see the scale for Tracy Widom is awful. n to the minus 7 thicks. It's, it's, it's hard to get out <laughs> of the theory. And, but simulations are very encouraging. <laughs> These are QQ plots <laughs> of best fitting QQ plots versus of, of uh, simulations <laughs> under the, uh, this is all, of course, simulations, this is all a story under the erdos Renyi model. And it looks reasonably good. Um, so we're quite encouraged by this. And incidentally, what's rather interesting is that, um, I guess I have time to tell you another little story. Uh, if you do the likelihood, if you try to do the likelihood, and you sort of play some games and get yourself to a maximization, you end up with a maximization which is combinatorial. You have to maximize over all possible assignments. But if you relax that maximization, if you make these things, instead of being indicators, functions which can take on any value between 0 and 1, lo and behold, you get this. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's encouraging. Oh, here's, here's a little bit of history, which I'm going to skip over quickly. As you can see, the tracy widom distribution is best thought of uh, in terms of tables. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the most natural distribution. It's, it's uh, the logarithm of the uh, distribution function uh, satisfies a uh, panel of, or uh, it related to a solution to a panel of A equation of type 2 which is not something I'd certainly known before. <laughs> um, but this is all very nicely tabled by now. Uh, and I'm going to just skip this. This is the history of how this arose. It's a very beautiful history. By the way, this conjecture of ours rests upon a result which was just proved <laughs> by uh, uh, Erdős, but not Paul Erdős, but maybe some relative of Erdős. <laughs> And, and, and others, which tells you that actually the results which had been proved about Tracy Widom for the case, for the Gaussian case, where you can compute anything, actually hold for the case where you have a matrix composed of IID variables with arbitrary mean zero distributions. <laughs> and, you know, the proof takes 75 pages, uses things called Dyson Brownian motions and so on, and, uh, <laughs> is well beyond me, but luckily they did it. So, so, uh, 
All right, so finally, I'll close with a quick discussion. Uh, block models by now, I think, are pretty well understood. And there are fast algorithms being developed in this regime. If you want to look at the case, which you might say is more realistic, where the degree is large, but it's not just faster of order log n, you can get consistency, but not root n consistency. And in general, things become much more delicate. Lambda n equals big O1, which is the favorite province of probabilists, is really bad from a statistical point of view because some parameters become unidentifiable, right? Because what happens in that case is that you have whole bunches, a fraction of the points is isolated. Well, there's no way you can figure out anything about communities and unlabeled graphs from isolated points. So you, and, and those points are not isolated or grand by any means. <laughs> Um, okay, so we need flexible, easily fitted extensions, uh, but I think that that's all in part happening and in part to be to happen. Statistical extensions, again, things you know on, on, on the ground are, are used, covariance, dynamics, and so on. But the theory has not been developed uh, to, to any, I think, in a, in a very systematic way. Uh, one topic which I could have co uh, uh, covered but didn't is that there is, there are some quantities which do not depend upon this representation of, of um, um, in terms of this W function which has these problems. Namely things like motifs. That is, you count the number of triangles or you count the number of any pattern. There you don't need to know what the representation is. And those can be used for non-parametric testing and actually you can prove that some of those even work, acyclic ones, for example, work all the way down to lambda equals big O1. They, they, they converge at rate 1 over root n. But then there are issues of how do you count the bloody things. So there's always a problem. Um, and well, I think that's the end. But I hope you can see that there are lots and lots of, of, of open questions, even in the th theory as I presented it. And as soon as you start to work with data, <laughs> you will discover all sorts of, actually, new models to think about. For example, it's, it's, uh, star, it's, in some applications, we've started to work with protein networks. Well, with protein networks, in order to get, to get uh, the, the, the different compounds. Well, you want blocks, all right, but the blocks have to be over, you have to permit overlap of the blocks, for example. And covariates are always there. And how you say you, 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 you put these together with spectral methods, for example, is not, is not necessarily obvious. <laughs> so, so there's quite a bit to be done, and I hope uh, some of you get interested. <laughs>
set of Facebook data which was released by some employee of Facebook to a bunch of, of, of researchers in the social sciences. And they proceeded to start to work on it until somebody noticed that this data actually had on it not only identification by high school, uh, sex, house of residence at Caltech, and finally, to top it all off, Facebook number. <laughs> so, so, so um, I, in fact, uh, I don't know if it was in the New York Review of Books, but I, I, in fact, I, we tend to read the New York Times instead. But, but I remember seeing an article that people have been playing at this game of, you know, you look at data which has been uh, made secure as much as possible. Nevertheless, if you have data from other sources, you can, you can really learn a lot. That's, that's life. Is Berkeley involved in any military <laughs> research program? No, no university For is. is. NSA? Well, you, I, 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 I actually have an unclassified uh, contract with NSA, but that involves uh, problems put in a context which is, uh, which anybody can put them in. <laughs> and and um, otherwise, no. It's, uh, the, the university does not engage in classified research. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. On this uh, convergence to the Tracy Widom uh, distribution yes. that you mentioned, uh, I did not catch uh, w what is the regime uh, for the asymptotics. Is, is P uh, coupled to N in, such, in a certain way or? Yes, yes. This is, I should have said that. Uh, I think with that normalization, yes. it's P fixed. Okay. But you can work out the analog with normalizations I bet you only up to the nice regime. Okay. <laughs> Lambda and going okay. over lock and going to. Okay, that, that's what I suspected. Yes, okay. I think that's that's okay. right. Thank you. <laughs>